that you braved the coronavirus and you braved the experience of coming to a new place with new people. And uh, we're just glad that you're here. And our prayer for all of us, whether we're members who have been here a long time, who came to plant this brand new church here in Columbia, or whether you're brand new guests, um, our prayer for you is that you're going to leave here today having God's blessing. But not, but not in a way where the blessing ends with you. We want the blessing to be there in your life so that you can then go out and pass it on to someone else. And we are a church planting church. So the, the goal here is not to grow this big, massive empire in Colombia, but to grow and, and help make disciples who will then go out and do it again and again and again. And that's Jesus' vision, to spread his message to the ends of the earth. And that's what we're about here at Crossway. And we're a church where the problems of life meet the power of God. And so if you feel like you've got problems, you feel like, man, I don't know what to do. Listen, we've all been there. And I assure you that God's power is sufficient to get you from where you are to where he says that you need to be. And guys, there's a blessing waiting on us if we'll open our minds and open our hearts. But you see, I can preach my guts out this morning. And I can try to have the cutest uh, analogies or the cutest metaphors or the cutest illustrations. And I can try to be as crystal clear as I can. But I'm telling you, you'll be a step ahead if you will open your minds and hearts wide and ask God to show you what he wants you to see, what he wants you to hear. One thing that will help you with that is in your bulletin this morning, you can take out uh, the sermon notes and you can follow along and fill in the blanks as we go along and that will help you. One other thing I want to mention before we dive into our sermon material this morning, we're two weeks away from Easter. All right, and I don't know about you guys, but I've always loved Easter. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved hunting the eggs and finding the ones. I don't know how your family did it, but there was candy in some of them, but some of them had money in it, and I thought, man, that's the jackpot. But you know, the most interesting egg of all is the empty one, because it reminds us of the empty tomb, which is what Easter is really all about. Jesus died, and three days later, rose from the dead, and his tomb was found empty on that resurrection morning. And so we want to do something very special on that day. We celebrate Easter really three, uh, 365 days a year, okay? We live because of the resurrection. But on that day, we do like to do something a little special. So on that day, we're going to have uh, a special Easter message. We're going to have worship like normal. But we're going to be meeting in a park. And so you see this, uh, this little cute, bring all your peeps. You'll notice that there's one of those cards in each of your bulletins this morning. And what we want to do is encourage everyone this week, okay, starting today, get out in your community before spring break hits, okay? We're two weeks from spring break, then Easter's upon us. So we got all this week to get out into the community and invite people. And I want to challenge everyone here, whether you're a guest or whether you're a member, I want to challenge everybody to, to pick up some extra ones of these and try to give out three every single day for the next seven days. And then spring break will hit. A lot of us are going out of town. Our campus ministry is traveling to Florida to do a campus ministry retreat with some of our other uh, sister congregations. And that's going to be a blast. But let's get out this week and really invite. And in case you're a little nervous about inviting and handing people a card, it's easier than you might think. But I want to give you a little video to encourage you in that. It's our neighbor, Kevin. Hey, neighbor! Can you see me? That is a very high-tech normal you got there. Very 2001. Space Odyssey, not the year. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's our neighbor. Hey, I brought back all your stuff I ever borrowed from you. All of it. Yeah, you know what? You just stay right there. I'll show it to you, all right? Remember this? That was fun, wasn't it? Thanks for that. I know I borrowed this to make them muffins, but it is fantastic at sifting through the cat litter. I'll get you a new one. <laughs> hey, is this your house key? You know what? I'll just let myself in. Stop!
Hey, sermon's up there, mister. I'm trying to learn about my Savior's birth. Resurrection. Whatever. Hey, you go to church? Why didn't you just invite me? Daddy, why didn't you invite Kevin to church? Oh, please, like you invited your neighbors to church. <laughs> hey, welcome. Glad y'all are here. Happy Easter. It's really not that difficult. Hey, can I keep your nunchucks? All right, hopefully that encourages you and gives you all the courage that you'll need to go out into the community and invite some folks. But we're going to dive into our lesson this morning. We're continuing our series called Under Armour, the performance apparel. And unlike the popular clothing company that is all about equipping us and giving us these, these dry, uh, uh, what, are, what are they called, the dry fit stuff that wicks away sweat and all the, their performance apparel. But the performance apparel that we're talking about is the armor of God. And it's the supernaturally powered armor. And so every week we've been diving into this passage in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. And we're going to read it again this morning as we begin. But we've been unpacking verse by verse all these different pieces of armor. So let's read this together. It says uh, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so this morning, we're going to hone in on verse 15. There's an interesting thing that A.T. Robert, Robertson, a famous um, and well-known Greek scholar, said about this section of Scripture. Those passages that we just read together, he said of this passage that it's the most complicated section of Greek that any interpreter or any translator, I should say, has to translate. It's very complex. And so what you're going to find, particularly with verse 15, it's tricky. The way the language is and the way it, it bleeds over into English. And so what I've done on your notes is I've given you a couple of different translations of this. So you have the one that we read. That's in the NIV. And then we have two more on your notes. The first one is in the New American Standard version of the Bible. And what the New American Standard is, it, it just FYI, it's a word-for-word -word translation from Greek to English, word for word. The other translation that we're going to read together, the New Living Translation, is not word for word translation from the Greek. It's thought for thought translation from the Greek. There's a difference. But listen to both of these, and I think we get a good feel of what it is. I'll read all three. First in the NIV. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The New American Standard says, having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then lastly, the New Living Translation says this, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Now, there's one thought that comes out in all of them. And it's this idea that we can be sure God really wants us to make sure our feet are prepared. That our feet are ready, right? And so our feet is what makes us mobile. And so there's this component to it that we need to be prepared to go. We need to be ready 
to fight and to pursue the things that God calls us to. And if the Christian soldier is to be ready to stand in the face of whatever situation comes his or her way, he or she must be grounded in the gospel of peace. Now, I want to play a game. Because we need a good image, okay, of why, you know, you might think about this. Like, we started off and we talked about the belt of truth. And everybody's like, oh man, can we get to the sword? It's more exciting, you know. But the belt is so dynamic, it's so critical, it's so important. It holds the sword, it holds the shield, it holds the breastplate in place. Without truth, we're nothing, we're lost. The shoes are much that way. You say, man, what's the big deal about the shoes? Let's play a game. What would the person be involved in if they were wearing this? Close. What? Football. Soccer cleats, slightly different, but good try in the back there. Um, All right. What about this, if they're wearing this? Somebody's got to know this. Rock climbing. Now, real quickly... Can you, now that you know, okay, that's a rock climbing shoe, can you in your imagination put the person in there? Can you see their physique? It's a certain type of person that would wear professional rock climbing shoes, that would use something. These are very expensive, by the way. And so a very particular body type and type of person, you can just sort of picture them. You can, you can pr- picture the muscles in their legs, and you can picture the type of athlete that wears that shoe, much like the previous shoe. You can picture the guy in his pads. You can picture this muscular linebacker, or this, this really fast running back. You can see these guys connected to the shoes. What about this one? Hockey players. Can you see them? you got a couple in the room here, (laughs) right? Can you see them wearing these? All right, what's the next one? Listen. What? No. (laughs) Although the cowboy, of course, this is a cowboy boy. A cowboy wears them, right? You can strap some spurs on it, and you can picture that guy. He's probably got some, you know, skull in his lip or something, you know, and... But, and he walks a certain way, doesn't he? The people that wear these shoes, man, I, I'm telling you, I put them on and I played like Woody from Toy Story for our spooktacular event. When I put those boots on, I, I felt like I needed to walk a little different, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, felt myself, I felt my hands gravitating toward my buckle, you know? And if I were to dance, I'd probably do it, you know, something like that, you know? It, but the shoes sort of make the person in a way. Or it sort of defines... And, and kind of gives you a clear picture of what they're like. What's the next one? Snowshoes, right? And these are amazing. If you want to walk around in snow, that's the way to go. You, man, when it snowed here recently in Columbia, I never, well, I say never, I rarely fall. But I was wearing some flat shoes, something probably similar to what I got on now. And, man, I just hit a little patch and I went, boom. And it hurt. And Jason was with me. And he was silent. He didn't know what to do. He was in shock. And it was terrible. But if I had had snowshoes, I'd have been okay. Right? And can you picture the guy connected to the snowshoes? Is, are they wearing an elegant dress with no sleeves? No, you see something different, right? You see someone who's fully decked out in a warm, you know, snow kind of skiing kind of thing attire. What's the next one? Hiking, right? These are uh, Merrill, popular brand. There's Keen and some other brands out there. Who likes to hike? All right. Why are hiking boots so important? Other shoes will get you in trouble, right? Especially the more rugged, the more rigorous the hike, right? You need more specialty shoes depending on the task that you're trying to do. It's the shoes become so important. You wear high heels hiking and you're going to have a problem. What's the next one? Man, how do y'all get that so quick? I don't know why bowling shoes have to be so ugly, but they're all ugly and they're very easily identifiable. But listen, why why are bowling shoes so important? Y'all ever worn bowling shoes? What's the bottom front like? It's very slick, right? And it allows you on your follow-through for that foot that front foot to slide slightly. 
and so you have good form with your bowling. But just about every sport you play or every activity that you do, if it's extreme enough or it requires a special kind of skill, usually you have to match the skill with a particular type of shoe. What, what do we have next? Scuba, right? Scuba. Y'all ever been scuba diving? These help a lot. Right? You try to just paddle with your feet, and you're not going to go as fast. You're not going to go as far. It's going to take a lot more effort. You put these on, and man, you're like a fish. What's the next one? Finally, we get to the one for the morning. And this is called, I don't know if you know, you say sandal with weird nails in the bottom. Yeah, that's kind of what it is. But these were the Roman soldier's shoes. They were not any ordinary kind of shoe. They were made out of bronze or brass. Now, you don't see the, the bronze or brass here. You only see the under part of the shoe. They would coat it, or they would top it, I should say, with a, some type of metal, usually brass. And the shoes were primarily composed of two parts. You had one part called the greave, and, one, and then the shoe itself, which is pictured here. The greave, though, was a piece of beautifully tooled metal that began at the top of the knee and extended down past the lower leg, finally resting on the upper portion of the foot. And then this tube-like piece of metal caused the Roman soldier's shoes to look like boots that were made out of brass. And pictured here, the shoes were made out of leather straps. They were often covered by this bronze and brass or some other type of metal. And the sides of the shoe were held together by multiple pieces of durable leather. And on the bottoms of their thick sole, driven through the sole, were sturdy nails that they called hobnails. Spikes, sort of like baseball cleats, I guess, um, that dug into the ground and allowed them to stand regardless of the conditions that they were in. In fact, it was difficult for them to move backwards in these shoes. It was an advancing shoe. These shoes were designed to help them advance on the enemy. The shoe was an integral part of the piece of armor that provided both stability and mobility to the soldier. These shoes were called, and they're famous, okay, Caligae. And they were essential to the soldiers that wore them. And they were so essential that the army and the soldiers that wore them were called the Caligate, named after the shoes. They were worn by all ranks, including centurions who were in charge of um, lots of men, hundreds, uh, uh, 100 men or more. And no other shoe in history are as symbolic to the expansion of an empire than this shoe. When, when the Roman army would come forward, all you would see is the shiny brass down their shins. And it was this symbol, it was such a powerful symbol. And it struck fear in the hearts of men that they were coming against. And, it, and so much so that they became known as the Caligate. They were named after their shoes. But why? Because the shoes were so vital. And a soldier without shoes was an unsuccessful soldier. In other words, you had a dead soldier. No shoes, no Caligae, dead soldier, period. And so the shoes become so important to us this morning. And what I want to show you, I want to give you three things that these shoes provide. The gospel of peace is really what the shoes are all about. That there Our feet are going to be prepared. They're going to be made ready by the gospel of peace. So in a way, we're going to put the gospel of peace, strap up, and we're going to go. And the gospel of peace protects me, and it allows me to stand, number one, because the gospel enables me to be at peace with God. To be at peace with God. Now you go, wait a minute. I don't know what picture you came to church this morning with of God. Like what kind of picture do you have of God? There's a few in our culture. You've got the buddy Christ. You've seen that picture? Look it up sometime. The buddy Christ where he's like, hey. And he's just your buddy. He's your pal. You got Ashton, the, the, I'm sorry, the t-shirt made famous by Ashton Kutcher back in the day. Where it said, Jesus is my homeboy. And you've got these pictures with these long blonde locks of hair 
and blue eyes and white Jesus. And he's usually holding and cradling a little baby lamb. We have all these pictures. And a lot of the pictures have Jesus with this sort of glowing aura coming off of his scalp, you know. He looks so nice and so peaceful and so gentle and so calm. I don't know what picture you have of him. But when you think about needing to be protected by being at peace with God, man, if your only picture of God is this peaceful, love you no matter what, like, which is, some of that is true. He is a peaceful God. He does love you no matter what. But there's another part of God that is often not painted in our culture that we don't want to think about. And I want to read you a couple of passages of scripture to help frame this for us. So, because number one, listen to me. You don't want protection from something you don't think is a threat, right? You don't feel like I need protection from something that's not a threat. Can I just tell you, God is a threat to some. To those that don't know him, God is an absolute threat. Look at what the scripture says. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, the latter part of that verse, and verse 8, it says this. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. All right, we're about to see the re- he's going to be revealed. This is, he's going to be exposed. This is what he's like. Look at what it says. He'll be revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. What is your picture of angels? Can I tell you the biblical picture is not the little figurines that people have or the little paintings of babies with wings? That is not a biblical picture. That, when, every time in scripture when an angel is pictured, people are terrified. They're falling on their face, pleading, like, don't smite me. Don't kill me. It strikes terror in the hearts of people. There's something magnificent about these creatures called angels. But can you picture this? Jesus coming from heaven in blazing fire, accompanied by his strongest angels. This is a terrifying picture, not the ones that are so popular today. And look at what verse 8 says. What did he come to do? It says, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Now you hear that for a second. What is the gospel? It says you need to obey it or punishment's coming from blazing fire Jesus with his strongest angels. What is, it? what is the gospel? I need to know what it is and then I need to know how do I obey it. Because it says those that don't obey the gospel, there's nothing good coming. The gospel is this. This isn't in your notes, but you can write it down. If you want the biblical definition of the gospel, it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And Paul, uh, this, is, this is how it's explained. He says, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, on which you have taken your stand. You're saved by this gospel if you hold firmly to what I taught you. And then he says, I passed on to you guys, and I want to remind you of this. What I passed on to you, I passed on to you as of first importance. This gospel that saves you. He says that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. He says this is the gospel. The D-B-R. The death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel. That Jesus died for your sins, he was buried, but then three days later he came back from the dead. That's the gospel. Gospel simply means good news. So the good news is Jesus died, he was buried, and he came back from the dead. And then he promises if you'll obey the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, then no more, there's no punishment, but only glorious eternity with him. How do you obey the gospel? We're going to talk about that sort of toward the end, but I'll give you a... Here's the interesting thing. It's also not on your notes, but in Romans chapter 6, it says that you're baptized into the death of Christ. You're buried with him, and you resurrect to a new life. 
when the people asked Peter in Acts chapter 2, what do we do? What do we do about this? We killed the Messiah. And, and they had this godly sorrow welling up in their hearts. And they asked, what do we do? And the answer given to them was the same thing. It was repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Father. I'm sorry, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So how do you obey the gospel? You participate in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In this process called baptism. And, and it's the miracle of all miracles. Is it cool that Jesus turned water to wine? Yes. Is it cool that he walked on water? Yes. Is it cool that he could heal every disease and sickness? All of that's amazing. But I'm telling you that you could almost, in a sense, time travel and actually die with Jesus and be buried with him and resurrect to a new life in this thing called baptism, that's the miracle of all miracles. And that's how you obey the gospel. Excuse me for preaching for a moment. It wasn't even on my notes. But that's how you obey the gospel. The next verse on your notes is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 30 and 31. We need peace with God, and here's why. The Hebrew writer says, For we know the God who said, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay. Also said, The eternal one will judge his people. And then look at verse 31. It says this, It is truly a frightening thing to be on the wrong side of the living God. It is, a, it is truly a terrifying, frightening thing to not be in a right relationship with God. And we need desperately to be at peace with God. Can I just tell you, if you're not at peace with God, you're at war with God. There's only two categories of people in the world. We want to make it more complicated than that, but it's not. It's those that are at peace with God and those that are at war with God. There is no in-between. You're either on his side or you're not. You can be the most, most, listen, you can be over here and not at peace with God and be the most moral human being on this planet and outdo all those that are in a right relationship with God. And guess what? It doesn't matter. They're going to heaven and this group is not. You have to be at peace with God. You have to enter into his covenant agreement, accept his free offer of salvation, but you have to accept it on his terms. Can I show you just a, a very watered down metaphor, if you will, of what going up against God is really like? Look at this picture. That's what it's like. You do not stand a chance. You cannot stand up before God. This little guy is squaring up. He's like, bring it, big fella. But you're not going to have that conversation with God. You're not going to say, bring it, big fella. If, if you're in the presence of God and you're not at peace with him, in other words, you're not covered by his son, you, you're not made perfect by that one sacrifice like we talked about last week. He made perfect forever those who are being made holy. If you haven't been pronounced righteous, if you haven't put on the breastplate of righteousness and you're not at peace with him, there is no good that's going to come from showing up to judgment day. But only a terrifying ordeal. God is much more frightening if we're at war with him. We desperately need to wave the white flag of surrender. That's the only answer. The answer and how you become at peace with God is to surrender your life to King Jesus. It's through our surrender to King Jesus that we find peace and there is no other way. In Romans 5 verse 11. It says, and in addition to everything else, we're happy because God sent our Lord Jesus to make peace with us. Listen, that is good news. That's why Jesus came to make peace with us and God. A similar thought in Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. And I'm just going to preach through this for a second. So we unpack everything in the richness of this text. But listen to what he says. God was pleased for him to make peace. Jesus, by sacrificing his blood on the cross. Now, you hear that. How can a father be pleased 
for his son to shed his blood and die. How could a father be pleased with the death of his son? And not just any death, but the most humiliating and excruciatingly painful death that you could really endure. How could a father be pleased with that? And the answer is one thing. Because his love for you is that intense. Let that sink in for a second. He loves you and I so much that he wants to be with us so much that even the death of his son is pleasing. And he was pleased to have it happen. Verse 21. You used to be far from God. Why? Because sin separates you from God. It's what it does. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities or your sins, just a fancy word for sin, says your sin has separated you from your God so that he will not hear. It takes something other than just crying out. He will not hear. It takes dying with him, being buried and resurrecting anew. He says, your thoughts made you his enemies. Your thoughts made you his enemies. Because all of your actions that are evil come from where? Your mind, your heart. And it says, and you did these evil things. But his son became a human and died. So God made peace with you. And now he lets you stand in his presence. Look at this, this is beautiful. He lets you stand in his presence as people who are holy and faultless and innocent. That's what he did. When Jesus makes peace, he makes you perfect. He makes you faultless in the presence of God. When you walk into the presence of God, he sees his perfect son. He sees his perfect daughter. Not because you are perfect in your behavior, but because he made you perfect. But look at verse 23. But you must stay deeply rooted and firm in your faith. You must not give up the hope you received when you heard the good news. You see, guys... Jesus came to make peace. But can I tell you that you can reinstitute war. After he makes peace, you can say, you know what? I'm done with this. I don't like it anymore. I'm walking away. And I have to make sure that I don't give up the hope that I received when I heard the good news. And make a note of this. This is in your notes here. Peace with God is the foundation for all peace. It's the foundation for all peace. If you don't have peace with God, you don't have real peace anywhere in life. You can say, I'm at peace with, with plenty of people. I don't have a relationship with God. You can say, I don't believe in God, but I can still love people and be at peace with them. We're fine. No, you can't. You know why? Because whether you believe him or not, he's real. No matter what you think of him, doesn't change what he really is, okay? Like some people say, well, I just believe in the God that da-da-da-da-da. Well, it doesn't matter what type of God you think about or what type of God you believe. He's still a reality, and he is who he is, and your thoughts about him don't change who he is, right? And so for those that say, I don't believe in God, but I can still be at peace with you, well, really you can't. Because everyone needs this God and everyone needs this peace. And without this peace, there's going to be punishment. There's going to be war with this real God. And so you don't get to say, I love this person, but I'm not going to tell them about God. I don't get to say, I love you and I'm at peace with you, but not help them come to peace with God. You have to have them all working together. The foundation of all peace is peace with God. And this morning... I want us to be mindful. And so we're going to take the Lord's Supper in just a moment. I'm going to pray. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. And what the Lord's Supper is, Jesus instituted this meal. It's just a simple meal. Little piece of bread, little cup of juice that we provide here that's nice and um, coronavirus friendly, self-contained packets. Don't taste that great. I think maybe they date back to the actual original Lord's Supper. It kind of tastes like that. But ignore the taste because it's beyond the taste. We're, we're looking at what do these emblems represent. One, the bread represents his body. 
The cup, the juice, the fruit of the vine represents his blood that was shed. And it's only because his body was broken and his blood was shed that we can have peace with God if we will accept it, if we'll wave the white flag of surrender. Let's remember his great gift as we pray and take of these emblems. God, thank you. Thank you for waking us all up this morning. There's a lot of things we could be doing. Uh, and yet we're here listening to your word. We're here singing songs of praise to you and songs of admonishment to each other. And Father, the goal of this morning is not just to go through some religious motions. The goal of this morning is for us to be drawn closer to you, to, be, to have our minds and our hearts pricked by your word in a way, God, that it prompts us to be better and to be at peace with you. Father, for those that are not at peace, I pray that they can see the danger, that they can see the urgency to make things right with you. And Father, for those that have embraced you, that are at peace with you, can you just, Father, help us to really realize and make it even more real than it already is how intense your love is for us and make it so intense and so clear in our minds that we can do nothing but tell everyone we come in contact with about the good news and how they can be at peace as well. Father, thank you for these emblems that remind us of your great gift. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Your love is more than my mind can fathom, more than I know. Your love is more than the highest heavens, more than forever. Before creation, you knew my name. You formed my life in your hand. You breathed in me and I came to life. You heard my voice when I cried. You put the touch in my fingertips. You put a song on my lips. You touch my eyes and I see the world. My ears to hear your words. Your love is more than my mind can fathom, more than I know. Your love is more than the highest heavens, more than forever. Before you knew me, so, when I had no place to go, you came to me when my way was lost. Your love flowed from a cross. You put a warmth in a heart so cold. destiny Lord you set me free your love is more than my mind can fathom more than I know your love is more than the highest heavens more then forever sometimes the future seems so unsure sometimes my heart is afraid i draw my comfort from knowing you lord you are my friend your love is more than my mind can fathom more
more than I know. Your love is more than the highest heavens, more than forever, more than my mind can fathom, more than I know. Your love is more than the highest heavens, more than forever, more than my mind can fathom, more than I know. Your love is more. time there just to reflect and remember and just let God work on your mind and your heart. That's my prayer for you guys, you know. I was talking to our group this week just about a, um, a time when Paul was looking for a quiet place to pray and um, he ran into, he thought what he was going to find is a place of prayer, a nice quiet place to pray and what he ran into was a group of women. <laughs> and so that's maybe quite the opposite of a quiet place, right? Most of the time. Sorry, ladies, but it's true. Y'all got more words than we do by a lot. Uh, but anyway, um, but he runs into these ladies. And he, he doesn't complain. He doesn't find a new place. But he inserts himself into that situation. He tells Lydia and he tells this message, the gospel message to these ladies. And it says something very interesting in that text. It says, and God opened the heart of Lydia. To respond to Paul's message. So Paul was this great preacher. This, maybe this persuasive speaker. And he, he did a good job of just spreading the gospel all over the place. But if it wasn't for that component of God opening up someone's heart. You have to wonder would it have succeeded at all. And so my prayer for you is that God will open your heart this morning. That you will allow him. You got some control over that okay. That you'll allow him to open your heart to hear what he wants you to hear. I want to give you the second thing on your notes there. The second way the gospel um, enables me to stand, enables me to be protected. That these, this gospel of peace that I'm strapping up onto my feet, it protects me because the gospel enables me to have the peace of God. Now you say, what's the difference? What is the peace with God and how's that different than the peace of God? Well, let's look at what John chapter 14 verses, verse 27 says. And this is... Jesus, and he says this, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and peace of heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Wow. Jesus is preparing to go to his death. And so he's getting his disciples ready in these verses. In this conversation that he's having with them. That we just get a snippet of this morning. But he's telling them, guys, I'm going to leave you a gift. Listen, some terrifying things are going to happen. I'm going to die in front of you. Some of them objected. He has to tell Peter, no, Peter, get behind me. And he calls him Satan because Peter's opposed him saying, I'll never let that happen. But he's telling him there's some scary stuff that's going to start going down. They're going to kill me. And then they're going to start coming after you. And they'll kick you out of their synagogues. And they'll put you to death. And they'll torture you. And they'll do all these horrible things. And he's telling them all these things. But he says, I'm leaving you with a gift that surpasses all of those circumstances that are going to come. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift of peace of mind and peace of heart. And then he says something interesting. He says, and the peace I give, the world doesn't offer. You have to get it from me. Now, we think we can get peace from the world. You think life gets hard, what do you do? Well, let's go smoke some weed. Or life gets hard, what do you do? Let's booze it up. Let's forget about our problems. Let's drown our sorrows. That's the phrase, right? Or let's just go party. Let's, I just don't want to think. I just, don't, I just want to veg out. I just want, give me some Netflix. That'll give me peace. 
Yeah, the problem is none of that fixes anything. And so you wake up the next day with the same problems facing you. Only now you have to face them with a hangover. And you sit here in church and you're like, yeah, it does sound stupid. <laughs> you know, but like in the moment, it sounds like a great idea. And Jesus says, man, the world doesn't offer peace. It offers this temporary little release or temporary satisfaction. Maybe it spikes the endorphins in your brains for a little bit or it, or it numbs you for a little bit. But ultimately, it's not fixing anything. You're going to have to go back over and over and over again and you'll never be satisfied. You'll never be filled. Or you can come to me, the only source of true peace, the gift that only I can give, that the world doesn't offer. And then... No matter what comes your way, you don't have to be afraid. Now notice Jesus didn't promise that if you'll, you'll have peace because I'll make problems just not come your way. He says, no, you'll have peace when the problems come your way. Bad things are still going to happen. But you'll be able to face them with confidence and not be afraid. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16, he says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times. Here's the peace of God. He is literally giving you his peace. Just like last week we learned that he gives us his breastplate. <laughs> like he gives us his armor, the same armor that Jesus put on. He says, here, you can use this armor too. He gives us his peace. Notice what he says. The Lord of peace himself give you his peace when? At all times. And in every situation, the Lord be with you all. Now very often if something bad is happening, we pray for it to go away. We pray for it to not happen at all. That would be our preference most of the time. We don't like adversity. We don't like trouble. We don't like pain. We don't like suffering. We want to avoid it at all costs. And sometimes, though, God allows those things to happen. And the scripture actually talks about times where he might even cause it. And in those times, the scripture says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you like a son, the Hebrew writer would say. And you're not illegitimate tr children. No, you're, you're real sons. And so he really lets you go through it. And at the end of it, he hopes that it will produce in you some growth. He hopes that it will produce in you a harvest of righteousness, the Hebrew writer would say. But it only happens that way for those that are trained by it. Only those that are willing to go through it, but in the middle of the storm, have peace. How can you do that? How can you have peace right in the middle of the crap? You think about your crap. Think about your situations in life that you would rather do without. Think about the hurts, the pains, maybe in your past, maybe in your present, or maybe what you're worrying about in the future. We have all of those things going on in life, right? If you're doing fine right now, give it a day or two, and a problem will arise. If you're doing all right now, give it a day or two and you'll remember something that's still not taken care of, that you've never addressed. Listen, we can have peace at all times. You ever known someone? There's really three categories of people, I think. There's three types of people. You've got the sky is falling people. Like the smallest little thing happens and like, oh, all is lost. How am I going to make it? Woe is me. You know those people, right? That's one type. Then you've got on the other end of the spectrum, the ones that ignore it and pretend there are no problems. Right? Carefree. Don't care about anything. Eh, it's no big deal. Whatever. I'll just sweep it under the rug. Then I'll buy a bigger rug. And then you've got the third type of person that we're talking about here. The one that's embraced Jesus' peace. That no matter what's happening, you can still be okay. It's not that you're ignoring it. You're dealing with it. You're going through it. You're trying to learn from it. You're doing something with it actively. But you're not like, oh, all is lost. You're not depressed. You're not 
shut down and paralyzed, but you're like, all right, God, what are you teaching me in this? This is hard. You're praying. You're reading scripture. You're learning. You're growing through it, and you're dealing with it. It's hard, but you're dealing with it, and you're at peace, though, because you know there's something that surpasses all these circumstances. There's something greater. I'm at peace with God. Therefore, I can have the peace of God in these circumstances. Let me uh, uh, read you a verse in um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. This is the first part of the verse. And Paul says this to the church in Colossae. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. In the, Eng- uh, the easy to read version of this, it says it this way. Let the peace that Christ gives control your thinking. You see, some of you need to do a better job of taking thoughts captive. You think all kinds of stuff. But are all thoughts created equal? The obvious answer is no. You think stupid things sometimes. You think irrational things sometimes. Illogical things. You think things that you should know better than. But some of you, before you give full vent to any thought that pops into your head, you need to take those captive. And the scripture would tell us to make them obedient to Christ. And I think that's what he's talking about here. He's saying, let the peace that Christ gives you control your thinking. Let it get a grip on what's really going on. Let Jesus interpret the situation instead of your frantic, panicky self. The word rule that's used here where he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts or control your thinking. The word rule is is key to understanding this overcoming, conquering, and dominating supernatural peace of God. The word rule was used to portray like an umpire or a referee in the gladiator type games or what we would call the Olympic games. By choosing to use this illustration, Paul tells us that there's a place whereby this peace of God can begin to call the shots and make all the decisions in your life. Instead of fretfulness, anxiety, and worry, you could translate the verse like this. Let the peace of God call the shots in your life. Let the peace of God umpire your life and your actions. Let the peace of God referee your emotions and your decisions. Something's got to get a grip on your brain or you'll never be at peace. I want to give you some areas where this gospel of peace provides, um, very specifically where it provides peace in my life. The first place, the gospel provides peace for my problems. Jesus said in John 16, he says, I've told you all of this so that trusting me, you'll be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, he says, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart, I have conquered the world. He says, it's going to happen. Not it might happen. He says, you're going to have problems. That's a promise from God. Now, they used to sell these little promise books that you give out for like graduation presents and stuff. You ever seen those? Like you go to the Christian bookstore and they sell these little, the promises of God. And it's like like clouds on it. It looks so nice. Can I tell you, these promises are never found in those books. It's all the happy stuff. As if life never has problems. But Jesus says, oh, yeah, the problems are going to come. But trust me, I've overcome the world. The world is is hard, yes, but I've already beat it. I've already conquered it. And I can give you peace that surpasses your problems. The second area, the gospel provides peace for my past. Go ahead and fill in the others because I know you can skip ahead. It also provides peace for my present. It also provides peace for my future. There's no area of life that God's peace won't touch. But let's look at the peace for my past. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, look at what Paul says to the church in Corinth. Now, this was a messed up church. They had lots of problems. Okay, Lots of sin problems. But look what he says. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. 
Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what some of you were. Circle that. Some of you were. He tells the church in Corinth, you were these things. This is a part of your past. But, he says, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Can I just say this, guys? Some of you need to be washed. Some of you need to be sanctified. Some of you need to be justified in the name of Jesus Christ. Justified is such a cool word and the easy way to remember what it means. It means it's just if I'd never sinned. He makes it such that you're just as though you never sinned. Justified. He makes you perfect, but you got to be washed. You got to be set apart for this noble purpose by God. But you see, the peace can conquer anything. You look at that list of sins, you're like, man, look at that past. They overcame. That's what they were. That's not what they are today. You know, you go to AA meetings and stuff like that, and they say, they make you introduce yourself at AA meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous, and the first thing they always make you do is they say, my name is Mackie, and I'm an alcoholic. And that never changes for the rest of your life. And yet Paul goes, some of you were drunkards, not are it is possible to move beyond whatever it is that you are dealing with. You can be different. You can make those things your past. Don't hang on. Pick your pet sin. Pick whatever it is that you constantly struggle with, whether it's insecurity or um, bad language or you just name it. Whatever it is. Or worry and anxiety. Whatever it is. And just... Have a vision for yourself for a moment that, that one day you'll be able to go, that's what I was. That's how I was. Because the gospel of peace can make it your was. It can make it your past. The other one, the gospel provides peace for my present. In 1 John 1, verses 6 through 8, it says, If we have a relationship with God and yet live in the dark... We're lying. We aren't being truthful. But if we live in the light in the same way that God is in the light, we have a relationship with each other. And the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from every sin. Notice it's in the present. So his, his blood will cleanse us and put things in our past. But then what about the present? I'm, I'm still going to be sinning. I'm still going to struggle with this sin thing. And he says, it cleanses us, present tense, from every sin. If we say we aren't sinful, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There are some groups out there that teach that once you become a Christian, there's no more sin. You don't sin anymore. That's a lie. It's just a lie. And it's a misunderstanding of some passages of Scripture actually in 1 John. But if they'd read just a little bit further in these verses here, they would see very clearly that if we say we're not sinful, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth isn't in us. But what he's saying here is not that once for all sin will be wiped out and it will just continually cleanse you over and over and over again no matter what you do, no matter what you think, no matter what you say. Listen, God's grace is amazing and it will his blood, the blood of his son, will continually cleanse you over and over and over again in your present sin. It will. But notice there's a caveat to that. It's not unconditional continual cleansing. The condition is that we have to remain walking in the light. And being a part of God's community people of light. It says, if we live in the light in the same way that God is in the light, then we have a relationship with each other and the blood of Jesus cleanses us. There is a condition. We have to stay in the light. We don't have to be perfect. The blood of Jesus takes care of those things. The grace of God takes care of those things over and over and over again. So long as our life 
is on the right path. And we're tracking with God in the light. Confessing our sins. Owning up to it. Fighting the devil. As long as we're pursuing God, the blood of Jesus takes care of it all. But if you go, I'm done with this. I walk back into the dark. I'm walking out of protection. The last one, well, almost last one. I I guess it's the last one in this section. The gospel provides peace for my future. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, the Hebrew writer says, Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus equip you with all you need for doing his will. You're going to need some things moving forward in the future. He says, I'll give you everything you need for doing his will. He'll, uh, may he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. In Philippians 4, 7, we get a beautiful, beautiful thought. Paul says, then you'll experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You know, the word guard is an interesting choice for Paul here because you know he's writing this from prison. And very likely, he's under guard while he's writing, maybe even chained to a soldier. And he says it'll guard your heart. It will protect it. It will keep it under careful watch. Remember how precious the heart is and how critical the mind and heart and they're interconnected. This is the true battleground. Your mind and your heart are the true battleground. You want to win the battle of sin? Fight it at the heart level. Fight it at the mind level. You try to fight it at the external performance kind of level and you're going to fail over and over and over again. But if you back up and you go, you know what? I got to come to some deep godly sorrow about this. This really has to bother me enough that I'm willing to change my mind about it. And then you'll see success. That's what repentance is really all about. It's about changing your mind. No matter what trouble or attack comes in the future, his peace can and will protect us. So it'll carry us into the future victoriously by guarding our hearts and minds and equipping us to be the men and women that he created us to be. The last point, this is how we fit our feet with the readiness of the gospel of peace. And this, this readiness that comes from the gospel of peace protects us because of this. The gospel enables me To make peace with others. Some of y'all. Need to buckle up right here. When you hear the phrase. You need to make peace with others. I bet you. Everyone has someone in mind. That things just aren't quite right. Maybe they hurt you. Maybe you hurt them. Maybe a little bit of both. Or maybe things just aren't healthy. Maybe it's just not outright bad, but but something's just not right. The gospel enables me to make peace with others. You think about this. If you have the peace with God, and then you have the peace of God, it's only natural that you'll be enabled to go make peace with others. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16... Paul says this, on the cross, Christ did away with our hatred for each other. He also made peace between us and God. Now, the context of this, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles who did not think very much of each other. If you think the black-white issue or African-American and Caucasian issue is a bad issue today, you're correct. But if you think it's any worse than the Jew-Gentile issue... You're misinformed. This was racism and bigotry and looking down on certain people because of the way they look or the way their culture is or all that. None of that is new. It's been going on since time really began and there was enough time to develop different types of people. About that amount of time it took. 
for people to start treating each other some kind of way based on external appearances. But the Jews and the Gentiles not only had some external appearance differences, but they also had deep cultural differences and deep belief system differences. And they did not like each other. And they would not associate with each other. We don't have to go too far into our history. And we find that there were black and white restrooms because no one wanted to be together. There were black and white water fountains because I don't want to dr- someone didn't want to drink after the other person of the other color. All of these things are not too distant in our past, okay? But can I just tell you that they, that Jews and Gentiles would not enter each other's homes. They wouldn't hang out with each other. It was very much the same kind of thing. But what does God say? What does Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit say in Ephesians 2:16? He says, "On the cross He did away with any hatred that we had for another group of people. So listen, if you hang on to racism or prejudices or or you're a bigot or any one of those labels, you treat someone differently than just they're a human being. If you do anything beyond that, what you're doing is spitting in the face of one of the biggest things that the cross accomplished. The cross accomplished the tearing down of all those barriers. They're gone. Now, if you want to reconstruct them, you're in opposition to God in a very serious way. He he not only accomplished, it's not just about racism here with the Jews and Gentiles. It goes deeper than that. If you have people that have hurt you that you need to offer forgiveness to, by not doing it, you spit in the face of the sacrifice on the cross as well. Because that whole thing was about Forgiveness. What did Jesus say from the cross? Father, forgive them, the ones that nailed me here. Forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. The peace of God enables me to make peace with others. The cross gives me that ability. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, it says, All this is from God. Through Christ, God made peace between himself and us. And God gave us the work of bringing people into peace with him. I mean that God was in Christ making peace between the world and himself. In Christ, God did not hold people guilty for their sins. And he gave us this message of peace to tell people. So we've been sent to speak for Christ. And it's like God is calling to people through us. We speak for Christ when we beg you to be at peace with God. Listen to that, man. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation, Paul would argue in this passage. He says, it's our job. God made peace with us, and then he said, now I want you to go make peace with other people, and I want you to go help them be at peace with God, which is the foundation of all peace. And notice what Jesus said. In Matthew 5, 9, as we close. Blessed are the peacemakers. What will they be called? Sons of God. Daughters of God. Children of God. Peacemakers. Jesus says, I will call them my children. Why? Why? Because they're like the father. And he'll be proud. And he'll say that's my boy. That's my girl. They're acting like me. I made peace with them. Now they're going and making peace with others. And not only are they fixing their broken relationships. But they're also helping people fix their broken relationships with God. Guys. Christianity. If all it is in your mind. Is a bunch of rules of things that you can't do anymore then you're going to think it's lame. You're going to think it's boring. You're going to think it's just kill, a killjoy. You're going to think it's not for me. But if you accept the new purpose of going out and being a peacemaker and helping people come to know God and find peace, you're going to have so much joy that you won't know what to do with it. I pray for you guys that you'll find the peace of God That you'll make peace with God. 
and that you'll ultimately accept his mission of going and being a peacemaker. But the choice starts with you. What are you going to do with the word this morning? What are you going to do with it? I propose to you that you can take out that cardstock piece of paper in your bulletin and you can start doing something right now. You can start making a commitment, just by writing it down, saying, this is what I'm going to do with the word that I heard this morning. But do something. This is just a small stroke of a pen. It's, some, it's a very small little commitment, okay? And God is calling you to something great. He wants you to be at peace, not at war with him. And he wants to get you on his mission to help other people do the same. I'm going to pray. And our, song, our, our worship team will sing a couple of songs. While they sing the first one, you can take that opportunity to fill out that card. And then we'll dismiss with a final song. And then at the end, if you can just drop those cards in our uh, baskets around the room as you go out. For our members, we would ask that you would just leave your contribution in there as well. For guests, don't put anything in there. We want to give to you this morning. And don't expect anything in return, okay? We love you guys and hope that you've been blessed by the message. And uh, get out and invite people to the Easter service. Invite them to next week too. I mean, you don't have to wait till Easter. It's just, but hey, let them know that we got a big egg hunt that we're planning for the kids. And it's going to be a great time out at Smith Park. Um, We'll be outdoors and it'll be fun. And so hopefully the weather will hold up. But anyway, let's pray uh, as we close this morning. God, thank you for your word. I pray that I have done an adequate job of presenting it. Father, it's not about my words, it's about yours. And so, Father, I pray that your words, not mine, would sink deep into the hearts of everyone here. That they would, that you, Father, through your Holy Spirit, would open their hearts wide enough to accept the word that's, that I know you're wanting to plant in them. And I pray, Father, for those that it has taken root in, that you would water it, that you would help it grow, that you would Just produce a great crop, Father, in their lives. And uh, draw us all close to you. Thank you for making peace through the cross where your son died for us all. And you offer that to all of us, God. Help us embrace it and help us to be willing, no matter what the circumstance is, to allow it to protect us and help us to go tell that great news that there is a peace that surpasses all understanding, that goes beyond the circumstance, that we'll be willing to share it with others. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.